Hey everybody, before we start the show, I wanted to let you know that this episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by D&D Beyond. D&D Beyond is the official digital tool set and game companion for... Dungeons and Dragons. Now, listen, you've heard me talk about D&D Beyond quite a bit on this podcast, uh, but my love for it is pretty genuine. I use it every single day. Uh, whenever I have multiple tabs open, uh, it is because they're all D&D Beyond tabs, and they are all open while I am crafting monsters, writing adventures, writing player options, anything like that. For World Builder Blog, for the DMs Guild, for Wizards of the Coast itself, I use this all the time while I am designing, and if you are designing, you should check out D&D Beyond. The basic rules are available for free on there. It's search it's all linked up. It's super, super easy to use. So go check it out at dndbeyond.com. You can use it for free with the basic rules, see how it's going. And then, hey, if you like it, I bet you can find a sale that's going on pretty much any time. Uh, so go check it out, dndbeyond.com. Let them know that we sent you. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intracasso. show we have grant ellis this has been a long time coming grant is an amazing game designer streamer member all around mogul mogul i don't know grant what do you think are you a mogul he's amazing he's an amazing person in the uh tabletop role-playing game community he preaches all the good things enthusiasm uh he lifts up voices that need to be lifted up he runs charity games and currently has a kickstarter that has already funded for grim world that's grim with a y and two m's grim world which is a fifth edition D&D campaign setting. We talk about Grant's experience here in the game world and have a blast doing it. So here is my chat with him. Okay, everybody, now I am here with one of my favorite people, uh, I, one of the people that I am glad to know every day uh, and glad that gaming has brought us together, the wonderful, intelligent, and charming Grant Ellis. Welcome to Tabletop Babble. For people who don't know, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? Well, based on that introduction, I am one of James and Tricasso's favorite people. Uh, that aside, my name is Grant Ellis. I'm an independent content creator for tabletop role-playing games. I'm the Twitch producer for WebDM's Twitch channel. I'm an independent designer that has worked in about six or seven different game systems over the past year, and uh, happy to be here. Nice, dude. It is so awesome to have you here. I remember chatting with you on Twitter long ago and then meeting you at a convention for the first time with Rudy Basso. Rudy and I were running around and you stopped us to say hi and watching your meteoric rise here in the tabletop role playing game industry. And it's no surprise uh, because uh, you're a very smart in person and you've also got this extremely interesting and wild background. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the first time you played a tabletop role-playing game. What did you play and how did it all go down? All right. The first role-playing game uh, that was a game designed to literally be an RPG with rules and frameworks and you're going to make characters is a uh, Western game, Star Wars, the role playing game, the 1980s yes. version. Yeah. So I, uh, my first experience playing the game, I had to be the game master and I was 11 years old and I had to run for a group of five surly uh, high school seniors. <laughs> uh, led by yeah, no right led by my older brother sam uh yeah, shout out to sam uh so sam brought me in uh to run the game they had been playing in the lunchroom at the high school using uh wooden pencils because wooden pencils have six sides and it's a game that uses six-sided dice and they would draw pips on each side of the pencil you weren't allowed to roll dice in school it was viewed as gambling uh and even if it wasn't gambling they would still suspend you for it so they'd roll wooden pencils and uh count the pips and play the game that way they brought me in to run the game uh for my birthday my brother bought me three adventures uh the first one was riders of the maelstrom 
and uh, I began to run, uh, having never looked at the rules. So uh, we got about uh, 15 to 20 minutes into the game when we collided with what would be the first mechanic. We're going to have to make a roll. I had no idea what that was. I didn't know how to set difficulty numbers. I, I wasn't too sure what the procedures were. And I was berated in front of everyone and my older brother. How dare you come here and make a fool of all of us and waste our time? You go home and you read that section on combat five times and you come back. And I started crying and I had to walk across the neighborhood lugging a Star Wars <laughs> rule book till I went home and I started reading I started reading it five times. About the third time through the section on combat, my older brother comes through the door. He's like, how far are you? I was like, well, uh, uh, three times through the section, but I get how it works now. And he's like, well, you, you fool. You should have lied and said you read it five times. You know how it works. Come back. Well, I guess. <laughs> my, and to a lot of people in you know the 21st century, uh, as opposed to the border of the 80s and 90s, this might seem like really harsh. You know, it, it it, it was, you know, it, it absolutely was. But I dusted myself off. Everyone was friends in that room. Uh, no one belittled each other anymore after that. And, you know, I, I love my older brother and he and I have worked together for decades since then. And I ran the rest of the adventure. I, I mean, it's a simple game with very simple mechanics. You know, set a number, roll to beat it. And we played through the first episode. And after that, they said, well, we need to move on to episode two. I hadn't read it yet. I immediately had to start improvising. I started looking at the pictures in the book. I started speed reading and I got us through all six episodes over the next six hours. And I was hooked. I wanted to play the game uh, every day from then on. And that's my first role playing experience. Uh, and just it was the best time of my life, you know, rocky start. But, you know, excellent finish. You know, it, it was great. It's in my bones and my blood now. Wow, that's awesome. It's funny because I feel like most people have that typical, I do, uh, older sibling story introduces you to the game, but most people don't have the, they made me be the <laughs> the person who ran the game. That is really fascinating. And so your first experience was really running games for people who already knew how to play games. Yeah, and uh, they had played a bit. And what was most helpful is not from that group, but a friend from the high school. Uh, John Sandal was his name. And uh, he came to visit my brother and he had all the source books. He had a bunch of painted minis. Um, he had uh, everything. We were playing with micro machines. We were playing with anything we could find that was Star Wars related action figures, uh, you know, pennies with x-wing taped on it using max masking tape you know you tape a little strip then write x-wing on it and we do these elaborate scenarios but john sandal had the game master's handbook and he let me borrow it um and i i borrowed it for a month i read it and it it told you how to convert things from all sorts of different media or fiction or historical accounts into a star wars adventure which really opened my brain um it I asked him if I could borrow it again about a year later. He said, tell you what, why don't you keep it? I don't need that book anymore. I've run this game for years and I just absorbed it. So that was probably the best education I received was in a handbook on how to run the game that was specifically on running the game. And it was, uh, you know, that was uh, what sort of changed my direction of playing games because I was running games. I was having fun. But I noticed uh, when Johnny ran the games. He was he was clearly superior. And it wasn't just because he was older. I never really bought into, well, he's older, so he's better. He had learned techniques that he could use that were beneficial in facilitating the game. Nice. And and you from that have also then learned things that have been beneficial. So at what point did you uh get involved and become a greater member of the RPG community online? All right. So a few years back, um, I, I had always tried to sort of poke at the online presence. Um, I, I, uh, I always wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons my whole life from the time I saw the cartoon as a kid. But I never really knew anyone that, that would run it in a way that we'd all play it and have a good experience with uh, playing the game. So I'd always played indie games. You know, I played uh, Over the Edge. I played uh, Unknown Armies, a lot of Earth Dawn. Uh, and I, Dungeon World, uh, Apocalypse World, Little Fears, and the, the list goes on and on and on. I've played dozens of indie games for decades, but I never played D&D, &D, always wanted to play. 
it wasn't until I started running Dungeons and Dragons and I noticed the game was a little different and it was a little different than what I was used to. But by the time fifth edition had come around, uh, the game had been demystified and it was simplified to a point where uh, it was very teachable in a what I'd call a rapid manner. And I was asked to speak at a local convention. Uh, same older brother who introduced me to role playing games is actually an animator uh, in Hollywood. And he uh, referred me to be their guest to talk about Dungeons and Dragons because I had become obsessed with the game. From that point on, I was invited to speak on a panel. And they said, we're going to bring some people from uh, the online community, people from various streaming communities uh, to talk about D&D. They'd love to do a panel and they'd love to have you on the panel and facilitate it. I have a background in media production, instructional design. I've actually spoken on a lot of panels about a variety of things over the years as an academic and a working professional. Uh, so I put together the best panel I could on uh, the evolution of Dungeons and Dragons over the past three years. And this would have been in about 2016. So fifth edition had been out for about two years. And some of the people that were on that uh, panel had, you know, tens of thousands of Twitter followers and uh, they, they put me over, so to speak. They started inviting me to be on their Twitch channels and run games and, I said I'd run, but I'd run on one condition that I could run 100% homebrewed settings uh, and run original content. I didn't want to run anything else that was published out there for several reasons. One, I felt people might want to buy adventures and then play them, and I didn't want to spoil any content. Two, that uh, we have a good variety of cast members, meaning that we focus on diversity. So all genders are represented, different ethnic backgrounds, different cultures, people from all over the world. Um, and that we emphasize diversity. And so they agreed to my terms and I started running online since then. Um, I met a lot of friends at that first PAX Unplugged where you and I met. And uh, I began to get involved in charity work. It, people had ideas. They wanted to do these RPG games for charity. And they were very grandiose ideas. They had very lofty goals and they wanted to make a very big impact and show that the community can make a difference. They didn't have a lot of support, though. Uh, I was an executive at the time that hadn't used any PTO. So I said, I'll take the entire month of December off to run games for your channel. 100% charity. I'll fill up the slots. I'll get all the players. And I'll take care of the technical side. So what I did is I took a copy of the Kobold Press Book of Layers, Sly Flourish's Fantastic Adventures, and uh, a couple other uh, what I'd call filler supplements. Uh, Nord Games, Revenge of the Horde, uh, 2C Gaming's TPK Handbook. And I just started running uh, three-hour sessions, uh, one a day, every day for the month of December. We raised, you know, over $10,000 in a short amount of time, you know, just over the month, all for charity. And I realized that, you know, the community has the opportunity to make a difference. I think that's really when people started to sort of take notice of me, because I had sort of been you know, on the fringes, interacting and engaging with people from time to time. And it wasn't until I shouldered the burden of that charity event, that specific charity event, that we saw change and uh, people started to uh, engage with me a lot more. I would say you are definitely known for these charity events because you didn't stop running charity events uh, that month uh, when your, you know, your PTO had dried up and it was a new year. Did you? No, not not at all. It, it, a new year came over and uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a charity event. There was an incident where the charity event got canceled and it got canceled over what I felt was sort of a arbitrary reason you know there was just some drama and people weren't getting along and i was just uh, I'll, I'll be totally honest i was livid that uh, people were taking away opportunities for less fortunate individuals to receive the benefits of charity and i do a lot of work with my local homeless shelter the local women's shelter and i've done that for years and i know the benefits that these facilities receive from charitable donations, real money being handed to them that they can spend uh, to feed their tenants, to feed the less fortunate. So I said, you know what? 
I'm going to do a week of charity. In fact, I'm going to do 10 days of charity and I'm going to take a vacation from work. I'm going to do nothing. I'm, I'm going to run three games a day and each game uh, I had designed it to have a scaling goal incentive. Every hundred dollars I raised the goal. We've raised uh, you know multiple thousands of dollars based on that charity event. And then last year I decided to do a charity event with WebDM to raise money for both Trans Lifeline and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, uh, where we would uh, do equal donations to both charities. And you and I played games in that charity event. Uh, it's really just sort of written on my heart that you know we have opportunities to play these games, have a lot of fun, and give back to those. And uh, it's, it's really been in, uh, enriching and rewarding. And it's really where my heart's at, that we have the opportunity to provide entertainment as well as make people aware of causes that perhaps they weren't aware of before. Well, you have a big heart, dude. And in addition to that very enormous heart, uh, you apparently have more hours in the day than the rest of us um, because not only are you streaming and running games, uh, you're also designing games. How did you get into design? So... I've always wanted to be a game designer. About 10 years ago, I would check out books from my university library, such as Challenges for Game Designers, where a, a prominent game designer, award-winning game designer with decades of experience had put together maybe 200 challenges for designers. And, you know, here, uh, try to make a game that uses an IP and it has to have fog of war and tiles put together a game design document and a prototype, and then uh, show it to people. Likewise, take a game that's 100% skill-based, such as tic-tac-toe, add a luck component. I'm going to give you six-sided dice. Now make a game that involves tic-tac-toe and six-sided dice. So you'd work on these prototypes, and that was maybe a decade ago. I was just always interested in it. Um, but I never really had confidence to pursue it uh, within tabletop. It always seemed very daunting, and it seemed like something that I probably had the skill set to to do but i never really had opportunity and about 18 months ago i was approached by a publisher that wanted to try me out on a project they let me know that i didn't have to be a mechanics guru and they wanted to borrow me for narrative design uh, come up with concepts and write game text and they let me know if i felt comfortable attempting to tackle the mechanic side that uh, they're giving me full reign to do that. And then they'll look at my designs. Well, I put myself to school on the design of mechanics and I engaged in Will Wright's masterclass of game, de game design, went through a couple other books um, and as well as did a lot of practice. I tried to become the most knowledgeable I could on the process for the systems that I was being asked to work in. Um, and from that opportunity, uh, I went on to get published. But we have to scroll back to about three months before that. It was at Origins, where I was hanging out with a number of designer friends. You were among them, uh, Joey Hake, Sean Merwin, uh, Jim McClure, Dan Dillon. And we were all just sort of hanging out. And I felt like I was probably the only member of that group hanging out. I had no design credits. Uh, and you just kind of looked at me and let me know, you know, there's a lot of ways to contribute to the community. And you weren't telling me to become a designer then, but everyone there sort of seemed like, look, Grant, if you just picked up a pen or start typing, you'd probably come up with something. But it wasn't until I met uh, 2C Gaming, the publisher, they started to give me opportunities. Then that was the first opportunity. They said, we'll design a monster group, the lore behind them, the tactics, how you would scale them uh, and their stat blocks and give us, you know, 10 monsters. And I did that. And uh, they actually said they were really happy with the work. And they're like, for 10 monsters, you know, we're all probably we'll pay you for all 10, but five will probably make it into this book. They're like, you're really close to having 10 diverse, unique creatures that aren't redundant, that could be really fun to play um, as a dungeon master in fifth edition D&D. Then the next challenge, they said, well, we'd like you to design an encounter that would push a party to their uppermost. Uh, limits. We also want you to sort of have this dynamic difficulty adjustment with advice to a game master if they were to slide the scale up or down during a game. 
to make it easier or harder, uh, have new strategies, have different things that could emerge in the combat. And so I, I, I did that. And then um, I had an idea for a show on a popular partner Twitch channel, which kind of started as a joke. And I was like, you know, I want to design a show that's also a game, but the show is part of the game. I want something that the audience actively participates in, not just through donations. They might be able to add fictional elements and so on and so forth. But I also want it to be high stakes drama with a lot of emotional investment. And I want to design mechanics that are very story oriented uh, and have a lot of narrative control where the players themselves can steer the story that's almost GMless. And I want to use professional actors and designers to sort of work together so we'll have very gripping performances, but also system mastery of the game. So I designed a game from scratch uh, that sort of our, our second play test was running on stream. And it went pretty well, but I could tell by one look at the player's face, she didn't have as much fun as she could have had. I talked with her about it. So I redesigned the game to a V2. Uh, then the next week, everything fell into place. So I designed a game from scratch. We ran it on a show. Uh, it was one of the most watched shows on Twitch uh, in the evenings on Saturday in the RPG community. Uh, very proud of that because it's something we designed from the ground up and uh, just put out there into the world. Plug it, plug it. What was it called? Unrestful Hearts in the Garden of Glory, which uh, isn't publicly available, but if people hit me up on Twitter, I'll send you a copy of the rules. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was sort of my love letter to these story-oriented games where you play dashing knights in a time of civil strife, uh, where it got most of the positive feedback was its uh, gender neutrality towards the world, where we had done enormous research into non-binary and uh, neutral titles of nobility such as suzerain and laird uh and potentate and domine um everyone was Sarah or chev and so people really <laughs> liked uh the inclusive nature of the game but what they also liked is you take turns setting scenes and so we'd we'd go around the table and someone would have a question about the game world that they wanted answered and then they would decide well in order to answer this question this player and this player need to have a scene together. And this is the conflict of the scene. Now we're going to play to find out what happens. And then we'd sort of resolve these scenes with a sort of narrative currency. And then each scene would be decided uh, with the role, a single roll of the die. And if we succeed, uh, it ends on a positive note. If we fail, it ends on a negative note. It, it was definitely a game that uh, we put a lot of heart into and where it got the most compliments is people are like, wow, you know, that was that was a full story, which was sort of the whole point of the game. I wanted something that people would tune in each week to follow. That's sort of a long rant on on a, a very specific game. But I was pitched, I was I was pitched on doing a campaign setting for fifth edition. Uh, and if I was to change some things or extend the system, we won't necessarily say change, but if we were to extend fifth edition. Uh, what are some mechanics I'd like to see added? So it's almost like the mixed martial arts of 5th edition at this point, where we're bringing in uh, mechanics and ideas from all over the world and very carefully integrating them into a 5th edition uh, format. It's incredible because that Origins, where we met, was not this summer that just passed, but the summer before that. And you've already done so much since then. I think probably from looking at all of us and thinking, well, if these jerks can do it, I can definitely do game design. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call you jerks, but uh, it's it's one of those things <laughs> where I think a lot of us have very similar uh, backgrounds and touchstones. Mm -hmm. And it's kind mm -hmm. of... I mean, this is really what we're supposed to be doing in the world right now, right? <laughs> sure. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Well, and it's it's fascinating because when you look at where we were, you know, less than a year and a half ago and think about like, wow, and now James Hake is, you know, a full-time staff writer at D&D Beyond and Dan Dillon is writing for WotC and you're launching this major Kickstarter and Sean Merwin has contributed to all these products as an Adventures League admin. Like uh, people have really come very far from that conversation. And it, it is cool to see that you are one of the people who has has come that far. Hey everyone, we're going to take a quick break and then back to the babble. Are you looking for a great story? 
Do you love Star Wars? Do you like podcasts? If you said yes to any of these, check out the Redemption Podcast. Well, I have less in my head than you do normally, probably. You haven't met the crew I'm with. Pretty much everywhere we go, our life is in danger. Things didn't explode. That's pretty sneaky for us. That sounds horrible. Yes, please finish up whatever underhanded thing you're doing on the computer terminals at the Jedi Temple. Check out Redemption Podcast at www.redemptionpodcast.com. Let's get back to the babble. I want to talk now about your Kickstarter. You are a game designer, and you are designing a game with the fine folks over at 2C Gaming. Uh, Tell me about this. Tell me about what you are creating. So the campaign setting that I'm designing for 2C Gaming is Grimworld. Grimworld is dark fairy tales told at twilight. We're going to go into these different cultural touchstones, such as Uh, Jim Henson's Storyteller, Chrono Trigger, the Japanese RPG for the Super Nintendo, Uh, Undertale, a recent game where music was very important. We're going to take all these cultural touchstones and we're going to add my own sensibility to it. And I wanted to portray a world that was familiar, but could really let the players stretch their storytelling legs out in. Uh, There's a couple aspects of Grimworld that is uh, unique and specific to that setting. The first is we have a narrator character. This idea comes out of the Japanese role-playing game, Ryutama. Ryutama has the concept of the Ryujin, which is a game master controlled character that sort of drives the narrative and the story. So we do something similar in Grimworld, where we have a meta character character without stat blocks they're not necessarily a god but rather they are the steward of stories and they are going to provide prompt suggestion and atmosphere to the game world as the player characters participate in it Uh, one ways they might do this is how they choose to represent themselves there's four flavors of story in grim world there are stories of battle which are warfare monster slaying dungeon delving And that is embodied by the season of winter and the idea that there is sort of a central storyteller behind war stories. So there's some symbology that goes into uh, that storyteller, wolves, dragons, etc. Likewise, there's stories of intrigue, stories of betrayal and sedition, solving mysteries showing up at a party and knowing that there's a contact you have to find and engage with, but who they are. This is sort of the James Bond storyline. The reason this is important that we separate, say, battle stories and mystery stories is the game structure might be a little different to solve a mystery than it is to fight a dragon. Likewise, there's stories of compassion, heartwarming stories, stories of friendship, and personal drama and relationships, Romantic stories, if you're familiar with games like Starcrossed or In Dreaming Avalon, these games focus on the romantic aspect of a story. Likewise, there's what we call the stories of truth, stories of hope and exploration and going on long journeys. Uh, An older computer game like the Oregon Trail might be similar to that, a point crawl or a hex crawl across a vast continent where... The journey is the story. You know, Frodo and Sam marching to Mordor. There's encounters. There's stories that happen along the way. But it's also a long and difficult travel. So what the game does is you have a narrator character that helps facilitate these stories. And they have mechanics that help reward players as they engage with these different story types. For example, if you're in a battle scenario... And you're fighting a dragon. And the dragon's very difficult. And everyone feels like maybe it's time to run away. Standing up valiantly to defend your allies is going to reward you in the game. And there's different mechanical benefits, such as allowing everyone to re-roll their or to roll their hit dice and regain hit points, or maybe restoring some spell slots, or maybe giving advantage on the next attack, or maybe a bonus to armor class. The Game Master has these different boons that they can give out as part of the game when the players lean into the story that they're telling. Likewise, if they withdraw, 
they have the option to add a little bit of drama to the game, uh, possibly making the challenges. You know, if you feel like running from the dragon, well, then the storyteller has the authority to make that dragon a lot tougher. So you want to run away and running away becomes the new story because the dragon is so dangerous. Uh, so that's some of the mechanical extensions. Likewise, we replaced the character creation system for fifth edition, making it about self-exploration and really, uh, really allowing a lot of creativity and customization before you ever get to your ability scores or your character class. You'll walk through the path of defining your physical identity, where you're going to describe your character's body type, their facial features, the vocal quality of their voice. So you might not be a great voice actor, but you know if I say they speak quick and raspy, it'll bring, it'll, it'll engage your senses how that character might sound. Likewise, you're going to declare their heritage. We do away with tra the traditional structure of race in Dungeons and Dragons as we know it. And we sort of say that there's four unique heritages in the land. And it's up to you to tell me what your heritage is. Uh, simply put, you are either humankind, fairy kind, uh, beast kin. Uh, you might be uh, a tree person. You might be a vegetable person. Or you might be automata. You might be an effigy person, uh, such as the Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz or the Tin Man, or even a gingerbread man. And in order to still allow you to have the mechanical benefits of what once was a race in Dungeons & Dragons, you're going to choose from a stack of about 12 different features. You're going to choose whether or not you have natural armor and a couple of innate spells that you know and your people know. Likewise, you might choose that uh, you want expertise and skills as well as uh, the ability to grow to a larger size or have an increased carrying capacity. But what we allow is for the player to use their agency to decide what they want. So this sort of gets away from tropes such as every orc has savage attacks. Therefore, it would behoove you to use weapons or choose a class uh, that takes advantage of these features. So really, we try to engage some agency. And your ability scores are modified through what we call superlative traits, where you use descriptive adjectives. For example, someone who is iron-willed would have plus two to their constitution. If they are strong, they would get plus one to strength. So you get to choose a plus two trait and a plus one trait, both your superior and improved traits. And then it comes with a bunch of unique uh, fairy tale centric character backgrounds such as composers, uh, knights, jacks, because jack tales are a thing, Jack the Giant Slayer, Jack of the Beanstalk. There's hundreds of jack stories in fairy tale literature. Uh, to outcast woodcutters, like Alibaba was a woodcutter. And after you go through this character path of describing your physical identity, declaring your heritage, choosing some special features and abilities that will make your character unique and picking a background, that's when you choose your class and your ability scores. So you're fleshed out with a variety of traits, flavor, and features, and then you're ready to play. And this system is compatible for any uh, campaign setting. You could take this and use it anywhere that you would like. Um, it's, it's designed to allow players to discover their character and we provide lists of the, uh, you know, about 30 different body types, facial features, vocal qualities, mannerisms. So if you want to describe that you have a very dutiful manner or a very fearless manner, you can choose that from a list or to pick one of your own. And we've worked hard to really bring this to life. And um, lastly, you know, there's an entire world that you can explore, which is uh, my my love letter to role playing games and all the arts being done by Samantha Darcy, who uh, many people know from the Uncaged series of books. Uh, we're good friends, have been for years, and we've worked really hard to sort of bring this uh, fairy tale vision to life. Oh yes, amazing artist. Um, I first I just like I love everything you're talking about, and I I love uh, how much you have hacked fifth edition and and used things from other systems and original creations of your own um 
uh, looking to Ryutama for inspiration is amazing. We did a whole episode of that uh, about Ryutama with Amber Seeger, uh, and it just blew my mind. And I was like, oh, I got to go buy and read this game right now. I haven't gotten to play it yet, but oh, I, I loved everything I read. It is really amazing. And obviously, you know, growing up as a kid who, uh, you know, I think we're around the same age, right? Like I grew up with all that stuff, never ending story, Jim Henson's storyteller, um, you know, all of these things that when you look back now, it's almost like, wow, did we really watch that as kids? That, that was some dark stuff. It's awesome to see all of this kind of thing going on where did you like where where did the idea come from i know that 2c asked you to pitch them on a, a setting but why did grimworld speak to you all right and some fans of mine may recognize some of the elements so my first season on twitch i ran a setting called brave new worlds which was grant ellis's uh Grant Ellis breaks fantasy tropes and runs D&D. &D. And uh, it's just, I, I kind of have this fairy tale DNA from playing story games with my older sister, who's about a year older than me, uh, to really being soaked in these, uh, really having close connections with these various touchstones. I think what really caused Grimworld itself to blossom and come about is a line and a quote by Neil Gaiman. And he attributes it to G.K. Chesterton, but it's original. And he says, fairy tales are more than true, not because they teach us that dragons exist, but because they teach us that dragons can be beaten. I look at my life and everything that I've overcome and how games have helped me assume more responsibility, achieve a certain level of confidence, become more caring to my neighbors and other people that I interact with have an improved sensitivity to the world around me and all people. I think what Grimworld came about because it's an opportunity to sort of explore the uniqueness of self and see where we all fit into the world ourselves. And I think fairy tales sometimes go to dark places and they go to very scary things and challenging things. I think part of the reasons they do that is because it allows us to discover that inner strength. So really, Grim Grimworld is me providing the opportunity to others to find that inner strength inside themselves. That's why the narrator character is there to help, e uh, help each player find a way through their particular story path. Likewise, to explore very different types of stories because there's more to life than just conflict we should take time to enjoy the peaceful moments together. But as a game, the game should help inform us how to do that and how to discover for ourselves the kind of life we want to live. So I think Grimworld itself is born out of my desire to empower people to tell their own stories and to live their best life. And one of the ways they can do that is within the safe space of a game. Wow. That is uh, that is amazingly deep and awesome. Uh, I was expecting you to say something like, you know, dark stuff is cool, and I grew up with that as a kid, uh, like I did. So uh, that is uh, that is really fascinating, and I know that you have a history of of wanting to help people live their best life. Um, a lot of the charity work you do, a lot of your messaging on your social media accounts and in your games is sort of related to uh, to that idea. Have you found in playtesting and, and writing and things like that that people uh, do have those experiences uh, that you want them to have? I think one of the great treasures of the game is it empowers them to have the experience that they're seeking. So... And that was my goal all along. So there's sort of this idea. Um, we we can, our experiences are somewhat informed by watching other people have experiences, and that's called story. Or our experiences of a, a toy or game experience by playing a game. And I've designed the game so people are having these these play experiences and finding what they're looking for, because we've given them a set of tools uh, to tell their own stories and discover that, which was secretly what I wanted all along. And I think the best part has been watching people discover their characters and 
getting to know a fictional character of their own design, their own creation. Uh, they didn't. Ne- uh, these players didn't necessarily feel like great storytellers from the start, but they realized just couple simple steps and they have highly evocative and descriptive language to describe this individual that's just come into the world and it's come out of their brain and it's come out of their heart uh, so i i've been fortunate to watch that in play testing where people are sort of discovering these characters they're discovering their the world around them and they're they're choosing how to engage with it on their own terms which is probably uh probably the greatest reward in the industry that I've seen is I've given people a game that they can play and then they can use that game for a couple different things. One, have some fun together as friends. Two, they can scale the challenge up if they're looking for, for, you know, a puzzle to solve or a mystery to unravel. Uh, Likewise, they, they have the opportunity to engage in the hobby on a variety of levels. So that's that's really where it's key with me, where they realize, you know, there's a lot to RPGs. It's more than swinging a sword. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I I agree with that. And I think a lot of people, uh, that is what captures them about RPGs, right? If we wanted to swing a sword over and over again, we would go buy a plastic one or play a video game or do that kind of thing. I I think... um, exactly what you're you're touching on and and harnessing and trying to enhance is is really interesting uh how have you found working with fifth edition is and and bringing in your new rules and everything do you find that it works well in fifth edition i think the real key uh is it works well if you take the time to achieve system mastery and I am not a system master, but I've had the opportunity to work with several. So when you work with a, uh, someone who has achieved system mastery, you sort of understand the bounds, binds, and limitations and the gaps that will be left as you start to modify. So let's take uh, race, for example. If you're going to rip race out of fifth edition, you've abolished it. It's gone. It leaves a void. So you have to figure out what you're going to put put in that place. I think I went through about seven iterations of what I wanted to replace it with as far as the character creation process and what would go there. I knew what gaps I had, but I wasn't too sure how I wanted the uh, players to uh, fill that gap and what tools or mechanics we would use. You know, you could give them a a list to choose from. So, uh, but uh, I had to think of the process as a whole. What what kind of user experience do I want when someone makes a character in a D&D game that doesn't have race as a component? So I think 5th edition is actually extremely powerful because of the way it's designed. I think it's designed with a lot of uh, modular parts where you can pull things out or put things on. Uh, the hardest part, uh, simply, in working with 5th edition is there's a lot of other great content out there. So if I'm going to be designing something, I want to try to solve a problem that I think needs to be worked on. And since there's so much design out there, it's it's challenging to figure out uh, whether or not I'm solving a new problem. In this instance, I think I was bringing a unique authorial designer voice uh, to the problem by introducing the character path and thinking about it from uh, the position that I took so I think fifth edition as a system to answer the original question is full of potential to work with. It's not as limited as uh, one might think, but you have to be prepared to get under the hood and understand the consequences of the decisions you make as you pull it apart and put it back together. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is a huge, huge part of, of game design too, right? Is understanding when I remove this piece, it doesn't just affect this piece I've removed. It affects the whole game. And how does it do that? What are the effects? Do I plug something new in there to fill that void? And then how will that then change the things that this piece changed? You know, if, if you're taking out race from D&D and plugging in something new, where are the ripple effects and how do things change? And, uh, you know, a, a lot of that comes through reading and playtesting and just, like you said, having mastery of the system is, is a big, big thing. What is it uh, that people can look forward to that you think is unique about Grimworld? Grimworld is unique in that you're going to have the opportunity to 
take the core rules of fifth edition and take full ownership of the story that you're telling while being supported by the mechanics. Sometimes we want to tell a story in a role-playing game and the mechanics don't quite support it. We're stuck. We've come to the limitation of the design. I think with some careful design work, we're empowering players to tell a broader range of stories that are supported by the mechanics. It's not just a dungeon master using fiat or taking their best guess or making a judgment call because there's a gap in the rules. You're supported by a framework, and the framework has very clear incentives, rewards, and consequences for engaging with it. But I think what players will find most unique about it is they're going to have an opportunity to push the limits of their play experience deep into the surreal. I don't think uh, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons has really uh, tapped into the philosophical side that you might find in Planescape as well as surreal dreamscapes of that setting. So I think this takes a few pages out of that and brings it uh, into the player's table right there in front of them. So I think outside of the mechanics, which we've talked about at length, I think you're really going to have a sense of wonder and dreams that sort of go beyond the material. And now at the time this podcast is live, people should already go and and check out right now Grimworld if they have not. Uh, what should they do to do that? They should go and hit up 2C Gaming on Twitter or Wise Papa Grant on Twitter. If you look up 2C Gaming, uh, their projects on Kickstarter, uh, we can include a link. They will have full access. Likewise, there's a number of documents from the get-go that you can download to get started in looking at the setting. The character path used to create characters is available for free. Likewise, the general rule set for portraying a narrator character in our setting, it's called the Narrador, uh, Portuguese being my second language. Uh, You can uh, take a look at the rule set for having a GM-controlled character who's a meta character in the game. Uh, Also, you should be able to take a look at our 20-page continent preview of Prometera, which is the continent in which uh, this Grimworld edition takes place. And all that's available on 2C Gaming's Kickstarter page. Grant, uh, I am super excited about this team up. I love 2C Gaming. I love you. Uh, It is great to see this marriage of minds come into the gaming world once again. Uh, Thank you so much for being here today on Tabletop Babble. Thank you so much for having me. Look forward to catching you at the next convention we are both attending. That was a great chat with Grant. Uh, He is one of the best people in this industry. So if you ever get a chance to hang or play a game with him, you should definitely do it. You know, people, Tabletop Babble is still a new show, and I could use your help uh, getting the word out. So if you could head on over to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. It will help other people find the show, even if they're not using iTunes. It's pretty crazy. Algorithms, they're nuts. I don't really understand how the internet works, but that is apparently how it works. Go leave us a five-star review, and if you leave it five stars, I'll read it out loud on this show. You can make me say anything you want. Also, hey, if you want to take it to the extra mile support us financially head on over to patreon.com slash intracasso that's patreon.com slash intracasso that is where you can help support the show you can for as little as one dollar a month you get a monthly survey you can vote on upcoming topics for the show help decide the direction tabletop babble is going and for five dollars you get little bits of extra content each month from me for ten dollars you also get to be part of an exclusive patreon only q and a uh Uh, So it is really fun. I'm having a blast doing it. Those of you who are already on there, thank you so much uh, for coming and supporting. Uh, Thank you. Special shout out to Patreon supporter Ian Worth and to Scott Koenig for all of their questions during the Q&A. It is super, super fun. Uh, This month during the Q&A, I'm actually going to be building a monster live on the internet. So look, look forward to that. Should be fun. Should be fun to expose my 
design chops to everybody. Uh, so yeah, so it should be a good time. All right. Well, that is, uh, I think going to do it for the plugin stuff. You can follow me on Twitter at James Intracasso and check out all of my work over at worldbuilderblog.com. show on the don't split the podcast network thanks to rudy basso for founding it with me our theme music which you're listening to right now was provided by battle bards don't forget rpgs are like sex Everybody, the episode of Tabletop Babble you just listened to was brought to you by Cobalt Press, the makers of many fine 5th edition third-party products. Everything is play-tested, amazingly designed, and now they have a Kickstarter for Deep Magic. You want to learn the secrets of Elven Magic, blast your enemies with Battle Magic, build cunning mechanical servants with Clockwork Magic? Well, guess what? Deep Magic from Cobalt Press is now on Kickstarter. It's more than 575 new and compiled spells by the best in the business, including Wizards of the Coast staffers and A-list freelancers. In this supplement, you'll find new magic schools, sorcerers, origins, warlock patrons, feats, spells, magic items, and more. It's already funded. It's blasting through the stretch goals. It's going to be the deal of a lifetime. So go check it out at coboldpress.com. Coboldpress.com for the deep magic Kickstarter. <laughs>